Hallelujah. Good morning, everybody. Happy Mother's Day, moms. Amen. Amen. We're we're going to be opening our Bibles up to uh, the Gospel of Mark once again, chapter 6. Page 1,000. Boy, we're still on page 1,000, huh? Yes. Yes, we are. (laughs) Did you ever think you could learn so much from page (laughs) 1,000? Amen. And I I mentioned to you a couple weeks back how um, I wasn't sure if I was going to skip over the scriptures we're going to do today because I didn't know if I had a message. And then I started studying it out. And boy, do I have a message for you. And it's not a Mother's Day message. I want you to know that. It's, it's a, we're continuing on in the expositional series on the Gospel of Mark. I'm going verse by verse through the Word of God. And, um, and I believe this is the word that the Lord wants for you today. Not to take away anything from Mother's Day. Um, and we're going to celebrate you moms in just a little while. But um, the Lord definitely wanted me to keep going on with what we were doing. And I just want to get this adjusted. There we go. So today we're going to be talking about the king who wasn't a king. And his name is King Herod. And you may recall in the Gospels, um, if, if, you're, if you've been reading the Gospels as a Christian, um, at the very beginning in um, the Gospel of Luke, um, it's the Christmas story, you know. And it's a story about how Jesus... Um, was born, how they had to escape to Egypt, how they came back, you know, the messenger angels. And um, when the wise men came to see King Herod, all right, he put out an edict to have all the children under two years old killed because he didn't want the Christ to return. This is not that Herod. That's the main thing I want you to get from this. That's his father, Herod the Great. And we're not really going to spend much time, we're not going to spend any time in Herod the Great today. His son, who we're going to talk about, his name is Herod Antipas. And what happened was, when Herod was going to die, he left a will. And he was King Herod the Great, was the king of of Israel. All of Israel. But when he died, he split the kingdom up into four parts for his sons. He actually had more sons than that, but he killed a few. And this Herod that we're going to talk about, he also murdered two of his own sons, had them strangled. All right. Not nice men, not uh, morally upright, you could say, right? And Herod Antipas was given a portion of the kingdom of Israel that included Galilee and Nazareth. All right. So he, none of these guys, these four brothers were actually kings. They were called tetrarchs. All right. And tetrarchs means... Four rulers. All right. So he was one of the tetrarchs. All right. So, um, and it's the story about, well, I have it written right up here. It's a study in compromise. It's, It's an illustration to us of the vacillation of one's emotions and agreements or disagreements with the things of God to the point of betrayal and how we are compromised. In the story of Herodias, as a part of this, his wife. Now, Herodias, King Herod's wife, Herod Antipas, his wife, is the is this actually his sister-in-law. And he marries her illegally. He actually takes her from his brother. She leaves him and she goes and marries Herod. So, you know, here Herod is a king in his portion of Israel that he's ruling. And he's a breaker of their own law. Gets worse. Herod Antipas was his half niece. And I'm not going to get into the bloodline and how that's very convoluted. But it turns out that she was not only Philip's wife, the brother who he stole her from, but he was also both Philip and Herod's niece. So he was also committing incest. All right. So this is, this is the time that we're entering in. This is the age that we're entering in. This is the state of morality and Jewish leadership, governmental leadership at the time. And, um, and so the story opens up with us having to go back and read the verses beforehand. We're in Mark 6. I'm going to turn there. Let's see if I can do this without glasses in my Bible. That's how bad my eyes are getting. And um, I can't read the numbers. There we go. Excuse me. I'm back. 
I'll edit that out. Um, all right, so 14. So you remember I preached to you last week that Jesus sent out the apostles, right? He gave them authorization to cast out demons, to heal people, and he gave them the commission to preach the gospel of repentance. And that's exactly what they did. And I went over this last week with you about how repentance didn't just mean they didn't just go out yelling repent and that was their message. It was the whole gospel. And I taught you how, uh, I spoke to you how, you know, repentance and belief are two sides of the same coin. Okay. But how it was interesting that the summary of the message he commissioned to go out was to repent, was to repent. And what does that mean? It wasn't like they were going out going, stop sinning. No, they were going out going. Turn back to God and then preached about Jesus. How do I know this? Because in verse, well, let me finish reading this. And they cast out many demons, this is verse 13, and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Who, who did that? The apostles, right? In the name of Jesus. But then when we see it in verse 14, in our first verse for today, King Herod heard of it. Heard of what? Their exploits. For Jesus' name had become known. So obviously the message wasn't simply repent. It was the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the apostles, as I shared with you last week, they were not lifting themselves up in their miracles. They weren't starting, you know, John the, John the Lesser Ministries.com. Right? They were, they were starting, I am a minister of Jesus Christ.com. So Jesus' name was getting known. And, and now we're going to read through these scriptures, verses 14 to 29. And I'm going to get into this more and explain what's going to happen. All right. Father God, I thank you for this time, Lord. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, I'm going to say it real simply and quick. Please speak through me today. May these words be your words, Lord God. May the message you have for the congregation be the message that goes out in the name of Jesus. In power, Lord God, to change hearts and change lives. May this not be, as somebody on the internet said to me, just the, just the teaching and coffee. It's just sad. The state of the church, I'm telling you, it's so sad. People are, people are so discouraged in so many ways, you know. And this is not just teaching and coffee. And I'm a witness to that watching you from here and in my interactions with you, how the Lord is using each one of you. Amen. Father, use me. <laughs> open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds and be glorified, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Okay, so Mark chapter 6, verse 14 to 29. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. In who? In Jesus. Even though it's the apostles who are going out. It's Jesus. It's never the minister. It's never the pastor. I, I don't like being elevated like that. It's Jesus. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. Now, what we're about to read from this point on, we're now going back in time. This is a telling going back in time. We're now going to get clarified on what verse 16, what that was all about. Here we go. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful to, for you to have your brother's wife. Just looking to see if I can read without glasses. And, Herod, and Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. Isn't that interesting? But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it to you. 
And he vowed to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. Spoiler alert, he didn't really mean that. It was an expression, all right? Uh, And she went out and said to her mother, for what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately, the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. So Jesus had a few words to say. You know, this is the record of what happened. But Jesus had an opinion of Herod Antipas. This is the man that we're talking about here today. The son of Herod the Great. Herod Antipas, Tetrarch of Galilee, Nazareth. And it comes from Luke 13, 31 to 32. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, to Jesus, get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. This is that Herod. And he said to them, go and tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow. And the third day I finish my course. Now, what is a fox, right? Well, metaphorically, a fox is a crafty and cunning, malicious person personified in this animal, okay? So Jesus had no love of Herod, and Jesus knew who Herod was. Jesus didn't consider Herod a believer. Now, Herod himself was a, um, he comes from a pagan lineage, And his family later converted to Judaism. And that's how they ended up in the Jewish kingdom. They were friends with Rome. And that's how Herod the Great ended up being a king. So on top of incest and on top of adultery, he also was a half-breed and a convert. And not a uh, moral man, right? Slide uh, 3, verse 14 to 16 King Herod heard of the preaching of Christ and his disciples. King Herod heard of it, for for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. He had already executed John the Baptist. The story of Herodias and the banquet and the dancing, all that's already happened. He's just recalling because what happened was he originally set out. Why did he originally set out to arrest John? Because of Herodias. Because he was going around John saying that Herod was um, an invalid king. Because of his sins. Because of marrying his brother's wife, the adultery, uh, the for, uh, incest. So he thought he had accomplished something in the end, in the quieting of John through. But then along comes Jesus. And he starts saying the same things. He's calling the king a fox and whatever else that he has said. Right. And not only that, now he sends 12 guys out with the same message. So things are not going well for Herod. He is he's going, this has not gotten better. This got worse. I thought I was solving a problem. Right? It also launches us into telling events, uh, the telling of the events leading up to the death of John the Baptist. And that's what the rest of this um, set of scriptures is about. His arrest over his public moral declarations of Herod's sins. But realize, however, that Herod is incorrect. Jesus is not the resurrected John the Baptist. All right? Because As we know from reading the Gospels, John the Baptist and Jesus were alive at the same time. John the Baptist and Jesus were born around the same time. 
think there was a few months difference, up to six months, they said, but we don't really know. And John the Baptist and Jesus were related. They were cousins. So Herod is quite wrong. In verses 17 to 18, for it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. It was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias. Tells us here that Herod went out and sought John and found him. And at this point, there's no love lost between Herod and John, right? He's the king. He's in the castle. He's got his wife. He's hearing reports about this guy who's eating locusts and, and wild honey and preaching to all the Jews that Herod is an immoral, illegitimate king. So, and Herodias is in his ear. It, it, it actually goes out of its way to tell us that Herodias is the main source of this antagonism on that end to Herod. So he goes out for her sake, the nagging wife, and he goes and gets John and puts him in prison. Now, he does not like John. He is not interested in John. He really doesn't want to hear what John has to say or maybe a little bit of it is having an impact. Maybe there's a part of Herod that is actually being convicted. But they're not friends. And he's not looking to protect this man. He is in prison to be killed, ultimately. He's not just in prison for life. All right? So it's really the beginning of a plan to end John the Baptist. How badly did she want John the Baptist stopped? Verse 19. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to jail for life. Death. That was the plan all along. Uh, You can make the case that Herodias is actually a New Testament illustration of another, and Herod, of another king and queen in the Old Testament. Jezebel and Ahab. Very manipulative. um, Trying to subvert the king to have her will exalted. Right? And obviously in ungodly ways. Which I don't think would make a difference even if it was godly. But in ungodly ways. She was not a believer. So up to this point, Herod likely has no problem with this. As far as having John in jail and the plot to have him killed. He had two of his own sons strangled to death. So for this man, murder was not a leap. It was not a challenge. But then something began to happen. For Herod, she could not have him put to death. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man. And he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. So Herod visited John, and then that something began to happen. Herod continued to visit John. Something was being sparked inside of him. While Herod did not appreciate John's message of adultery and being a lawbreaker, not adultery, yeah, of adultery, incest, and being a lawbreaker, He was coming to respect and fear John as a true man of God. He came to believe John was righteous and holy and right. But he had a wife, so on the one hand, right? And then on the other hand, he had a wife who clearly wanted John dead. And saw this imprisonment as an opportunity to accomplish that desire. So Herod, rather than being all the way over here, he started going all the way over here to John... And now he is here, stuck in the middle. Herod feared John and kept him safe until he didn't. Herod believed that in keeping John in prison, he was protecting him from Herodias, whom he knew wanted him dead. 
At least in the prison, he knew where John was and could keep a better eye on him and guard him. And isn't that interesting? He put him in jail to kill him and then realized my best bet of keeping this guy alive is to keep him in jail. Because at least I know where he is. I can put my most trusted guards there. I can tell them don't let anyone kill him. Right? It's very interesting how a nefarious goal could be turned that the same thing ends up being beneficial. When he heard him, he was much perplexed and he heard him gladly. What Herod heard from John perplexed him. And it's important, don't you think, that we take a close look at that word as it gives us insight into Herod's mind and struggle. You know, when I think of perplexed, I think of, huh. But it's more than just, huh, I'm perplexed, right? Next slide, please. Perplexed in the Strong's Concordance of the Hebrew and Greek Dictionary. Perplexed is the word aporeo. It means to be without resource, to doubt, to hesitate, not knowing how to proceed, determine, speak, or act. And this next one comes from Vine's uh, Dictionary. To be in circumstances where one cannot find a way out. The epitome of to be stuck in the middle. To be in a place of free, of being frozen. Because of the ramifications if I defy her. The ramifications if I, def- if I go against him. Because now I've come to believe he's actually a man of God and I fear him. And a lot of what he says interests me. Right? He, hear, he heard him gladly. He certainly didn't hear gladly about how he's committing incest and how he's committing adultery and how he's an illegitimate king for these reasons. Well, an illegitimate Jew for these reasons. So there's obviously more being spoken here about the gospel, about Christ, than what we're being led on to. And this man is being convinced that this guy is a man of God. So to have him killed, not a good thing. But to not do what the little woman over here wants, right, is not a good thing. There's actually a proverb about it, about, about living under the same roof with a quarreling spouse. All right? So Herod was between a moral rock and a hard place. In Herod, we see an illustration of one who is interested, yet unregenerate. He's not born again. But he's interested. Can anybody remember any recent sermons I've done speaking about that? The sower and the seed. The rocky soil. And then in the very next chapter, well no, at the beginning of that chapter, before I went into that, about the parables. And and the reason why Jesus started preaching in parables. It was to get get the interested disinterested. It wasn't to clarify things for those who wouldn't believe at that time. It was to confuse them to the point where they would just walk away. There were many on the periphery of the disciples who were interested and who received the word gladly. And I'm going to read to you now from our prior verses in Mark chapter 4, verses 16 to 17. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. Now, I don't want to give you the false impression that Herod Antipas was a believer. Which is really what this is speaking to people who profess to be believers. What I'm trying to get across to you is that he had the same interest as a rocky ground believer. And everything that applies there, we can still apply to him. Because that's exactly what happens in this narrative that we're reading today. It is a distinctly bad omen that Herod heard him gladly, since he had no claim to faith in Christ or the peace salvation brings to the soul. Interested is good, but it's never enough. Interested in Christ is good, but it's not enough to save you. And that's what you will hear from the multitudes that you share your faith with who you you walk away knowing that that they're not saved. 
but they express an interest. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. But there's no devotion in their life to God or Jesus. It's just this thing, you know? And it's really, it's, it, for me, it's a bur- I always walk away so burdened after conversations with people like that because it's like, you just don't get it, you know? Interested must be accom- accompanied at some point by conviction and humility. A coming to know one's illness, one's sin, and its result, hell, and come to the Savior for grace. And until that time comes, interest will never equal salvation. What we also are seeing here is the seduction of the flesh. We're seeing in, in Herod a process. I'm thinking of Jezebel in the Old Testament and her influence over her husband, King Ahab, to have the prophet Elijah killed. Now, Herod went from arresting John and planning on killing him, right, one, to two, interest and guilt feelings and the desire to keep him in prison to protect him instead of kill him from his Jezebel, Herodias. And then finally, three, and sadly, pridefully and fearfully, Herod giving into Herodias' manipulation and having John the Baptist beheaded. Verses 21 and 22. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it to you. So here in these verses, we arrive at what I've titled the vehicle of change. And it's a common vehicle when we as believers or unbelievers are trying to take some sort of moral stand as a human being in compromising positions. The vehicle of change is is quite common and it's seduction. Entertainment of sin and the indulgence of the flesh. Lust. It's not just sexual, folks. In this case, it is. Herod was seduced by his own stepdaughter. By his own niece. She was put on display to dance in a very provocative way. A way that nobility, it would be unheard of. This was not a uh, jazz dance. This was not a classical dance demonstration. This was a strip joint without the stripping, maybe. I I don't really know, but, you know, certainly scantily clad, revealingly clad, dancing. It was erotica. He was was seduced by his own stepdaughter and manipulated by his own wife, her mother, in a scenario reminiscent of Ahab and Jezebel. When we entertain that which is ungodly... Herodias' daughter dancing provocatively, enticing Herod and his guests with the flesh. It always leads to more of what is ungodly. In this case, Herod's vulnerability to oblige requests for more of what is sinful. And in this case, that ended up being John's murder. It's a great example of, of, of the pull of the flesh. Of how the enemy uses the flesh to get a, even a believer this can apply to. To do something that's not of the Lord. And if you can take one step, you can certainly take... Two. It's actually easier to take a second step and a third step. Verse 22. Uh, when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. So Herodias' daughter dances. Uh, Kenneth Weiss' word studies in the New Testament. This is an expert in ancient Greek. Has this to say about Herodias' dance. It was Herodias' own daughter who degraded herself in a licentious dance in which only professional actors of loose morals would engage. Such dancing was almost an unprecedented thing for women of rank or even respectability. The immoral spectacle catered to the total depraved natures of the drunken men, and Herod offers her a reward for this. I'm trying to vision one of my nieces. Me being in a room and she comes out like that. What would I do? How would I feel about that? It wouldn't happen. All right? 
just to give you an idea of the moral decay in these people. Verses 22 to 23. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. That's what he's doing. That's a pride statement. He's, he's got his guests next to him. Ask me whatever you wish and I will give it to you because I am all powerful, everyone you see. Up to half my kingdom. Now she knows this is a man who strangled two of his sons, had them strangled for just that reason. He felt threatened. Worst mistake this girl could do is go, can I have half the kingdom? She'd be dead within a week. So this is not what he's meaning. What he's meaning to say is that this is the kind of powerful man he is. It's a statement of pride. Herod did not literally mean he would surrender any part of his kingdom to anyone. Instead, he was out to impress his guests and was being hyperbolic and flamboyant. Proverbs 1.10 tells us, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. Proverbs 7.25-27 to tells us, let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not strain to her paths. For many victims she has laid low, and all her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. So you want to stay away from the seductress, don't you? Verses 24 to 25 tell us, And she went out and said to her mother, for what should I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. Jezebel found her way. Don't think she didn't realize that Herod was like delaying on this whole plan to have John killed. She's like, why is this guy still, you know, I'm, I'm just adding to the Bible here. You know, I'm, but I'm giving you a flavor. You're like, why is this man still alive? I'm going to have to take things into my own hands. Right? And then it just plops right into her lap. Ask him for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Have you ever been to a party? Or been a party to at that party? We're in a gathering of the corruption of another person. I've been that person and I've been that person. You know what I mean? I've been on both ends of that stick. Remember ever being at a party with some or some other social situation where there was someone who was considered innocent, who was eventually convinced to do something they were reluctant to do? Yeah. I've been that seductress. Where is God in any of this? Where is Satan? Certainly Satan is much closer than God is, isn't he? I think we know God, far away, Satan, right there. As innocent, the innocent are fallen, and they are laughed at, and they are mocked. Verse 26. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. This is uh, what you'll see in the party that we just discussed, in the social situation that you've discussed, in the um, new Christian who still insists on hanging out with all their old friends. You will see this happen. They give in. Because they're prideful and because they have the fear of man. For the sake of his oaths, is pride based. Of primary concern to Herod is his word and staying true to it. If Herod would be trustworthy, he must be seen as a king who keeps his word. Proverbs 16, 18 tell us pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And, you know, you could say, obviously, John had the greatest fall, not spiritually, but I mean, he has head cut off. You know that he entered glory right then and there. Herod, we never hear about Herod being converted. Herod went to hell or is waiting to go to hell, depending on your theology. It's not in a good spot. He did 
have pride before he went to destruction. And his haughty spirit was with him before he fell. Yet in this, there's also, there also is concern about what others will think. I just turned off my sermon. There we go, I'm back. Um, second point, for the sake of his dinner guests, he did not want to break his word to her. Fear of man. That's what that's saying. For the sake, well, it's saying pride and fear of man. He's got a reputation to uphold. And what will happen if they see me show John the Baptist mercy against my very own wife and daughter? Right? Surrounded by dinner guests, Herod could not be seen as sympathetic to this Christian evangelist, the baptizer. This excuse is therefore a fear of man based excuse. Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. You know, and we have to look past the current circumstances when we're applying this verse, because obviously as a Christian, I'm always safe choosing God, even if it means I'm going to have my head cut off. Because we're not looking at temporally, we're not looking necessarily to what we're going to get as a, uh, as a um, result of our actions here in this life. We're looking towards our eternity. Amen. Yes. Amen? The growing influence of Jesus and his mission expanded to the 12, which was my last two sermons to you. And this is, it's in turn, uh, increased the fame of Christ. This greatly concerned Herod because he thought he had nipped this all in the bud with the arrest and eventual death of John. And then Christ enters the picture, denouncing that old fox Herod. And even worse, now he has 12 others doing exactly the same thing. Verse 29, please. Slide 14, please. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. So I skipped over those other verses. Um, Herodias got away. He sent. John's head was taken off. They set up a nice... You ever... Um, well, I used to do catering. So you know you don't just put the meat on the platter. You put garnish around it. You make... That's what they did. They dressed it all up with parsley and maybe some vegetables. And, and they laughingly, I'm sure, paraded it out into the dinner hall to show Herod and Herodias. And uh, her name was Solomon, the daughter. So this immoral man, this murderer, had two of his own sons strangled, now has killed a Christian, a leader. Now, if you're one of his disciples... Are you going to go to him and demand the body back? What might happen if you go there and demand the body back? You might be on that platter right next to him. Think about the faith that had to take. Think about the prayers to God praying for strength and protection before they went. They did not go because of the threat. And nor should we. If the Lord is speaking to you. In anything you're doing as a believer. In sharing your faith. Being a light. Even if it means a threat. Amen. Then you pray up man. But you go. Yes. I count this life as dung. Right? To the glory of knowing Christ and, and the riches of his glory. So they come and they get John's body and they give it a proper burial. Knowing Herod's reputation and seeing it manifest in John's murder, this took commitment and bravery. Would we be so bold as to go to a Herod in our lives who has so treacherously dealt with a leader of a church in whose beliefs I subscribe? So the actions of Herod, well... His initial interest in glad reception of John and the convictions of his teaching upon Herod's spirit, right? 
His turning and wanting from wanting him dead to wanting to protect him from having his head cut off. They serve to remind us that a person, no more than a ship, can hope by drifting to arrive at a safe haven. Interest will not do it. Never making that decision will not do it. We must be steered to port. We must be guided by the stars. Right? I'm using all boat steering language here and methodology. The Bible, study, prayer, worship, the unity of the fellowship of the saints here, now, right here, church. It doesn't have to be. It could be dinner. It could be bingo. What are the games do Christians play? <laughs> right? Settlers of Catan. I don't know if any of you guys ever heard of Settlers of Catan. We were in Bible school. We used to play that game all the time. I don't know. It was a Christian thing. I don't know. But we must be steered the port and we must be guided by those stars. The stars with which, by which we steer the ship of our faith closer towards the cross of Christ. Closer towards Christ and not further away. Ever growing in relationship and holiness towards our Savior and King. And we must diligently stay on the path that they lay before us. They lay out before us. For at the same time, there are others who take pleasure in seeing us go off course. And if possible, never arrive at all into maturity or even salvation. The person interested in Christ and the born again believer both have many around them. The person who is interested in Jesus Christ or has a... You know, they're not, they're not adverse. And the born-again believer, they both have many around them who see sport in their attempts to get us to veer towards Satan and the shipwrecking of our faith. Does that make sense? There goes Chris. He's being a Jesus freak again, right? I'm talking about the dinner table at a holiday, you know? Come on, have a drink. Or the joints going around. You know, I mean, just, just, just name it. Finally, I'd like to draw a parallel between today's verses about Herod and John the Baptist. The words of God through the prophet Ezekiel. And the words of Jesus to us in the Gospel of Luke. And I'm going to start with you today um, with one of the verses from today. And that's Mark 6.20. For Herod feared John knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. All right, remember the rocky ground here? Now, Ezekiel 33, 30 to 32. This is God speaking to uh, Ezekiel. As for you, son of man, your people who talk together about you by the walls and at the doors of the houses say to one another, each to his brother, Come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. And they come to you as a people come. And they sit before you as my people. And they hear what you say, but they will not do it. For with lustful talk in their mouths, they act. Their heart is set on their gain. And behold, you are to them like one who sings lustful songs with a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument. For they hear what you say, but they will not do it. And then finally, Jesus to us in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verses 31 and 32. This is Jesus. To what then shall I compare the people of this generation, and what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not weep. To many of these people, you are, just, you are as useful to them as you are of interest to them. As a laugh, as a joke, right? The common theme in these three sets of scriptures is all the people in the context of these verses are rocky soil hearers. There's an interest, right? They're not rocky soil believers, 
the rocky soil hearers. They will listen to you as far as it interests them, entertains them, challenges them. And, you know, some people like to debate. But as soon as you cross whatever line they have drawn as far as their call for salvation, they don't want anything to do with you. They want that conversation over. Now, for us, it means ending the conversation. Sometimes it might mean getting spit at. Sometimes it might mean getting jumped. For John the Baptist, it meant getting your head cut off. For all the apostles, it meant a fate that none of us should have to face. Well, maybe we should. Maybe we will. I don't know. Right now, it's, very, it's much safer than it was for the apostles. But it didn't stop them, did it? Right? And I think about, you know, when I think about the apostles and their fate, I think about the apostle John, who did not die. But he was deep fried. They tried to kill him. They filled a cauldron up with, with boiling oil. Right? When we fry food, we, we set the oil to about 300, 350. This was boiling. This was like 500. And then they dropped him in it. And he didn't even get burned. Right? Hallelujah, right? Yeah. Peter ended up crucified upside down. Thomas ended up speared, killed. There, there might be a hallelujah for you in a miraculous delivery, or there might be a hallelujah for you in entering into glory. You so you're right either way with a hallelujah, but we must be sober. We must be understanding that, you know, it may not work out the way that you're hoping in the flesh. But our spirits, amen? Yes. Our spirits are secure. Amen. Yes. All right, so um, the lessons that I got from Herod here, I got three lessons. I, I had more, but I had to keep this. Sh I'm at 45 minutes. Um, this is actually a short message for me. And if you can go to the, uh, very good, the ladies are on top of it. Um, the lessons I got from Herod, the first one is the interested and the mocker alike have a primary concern to be entertained. They have their desires spoken of. To have their desires spoken of. They will listen to truth as long as it fits their subjective idea of interest or importance. And once truth goes where they wish it not to go, they lose interest at best and become angry and dangerous at worst. Second listen. We should not fool ourselves into thinking that because we did not out and out reject Christ, that we will someday be welcomed by God because in times past, we showed an interest in the message of the gospel. It takes more than interest. And you know, I, I know I'm that guy who said the sinner's prayer when I was 25 years old and, and didn't repent of anything. And within three years, I was gone. And for 11 years, I was gone. And then when, when God radically saved me on my deck out in Morris, New York. I, I gave my life to him, you know? Amen. And what that's going to look like for you is not necessarily what it's going to look like for me, but what it's going to look like in here, I, I, I would say should look like that. Your love for the Lord, your desires for the Lord, your hatred of the things that are not of the Lord. Not that they're all removed. The temptations, the old self, you're still battling, Right? The question is not, were you interested? The question is, did you humble yourself, repent, and believe the gospel? Amen. Did you humble yourself, repent, and believe the gospel? Amen. He died on the cross because you are a sinner. Because you've told lies, you've stolen, you've cheated, you've dishonored God, you've dishonored your family. You've gone your own way. You've put on the throne of your heart and your mind your morality. Your standard of what is good, right, and just. That's the whole spirit of repentance is saying, I am stepping off that throne, Lord, and putting you, what you're putting, and acknowledging you. I'm not putting you anywhere, God. <laughs> right? Hallelujah. Amen. Would you repent today? Would you turn to him today and put your faith in him today? Would you trust him and, and beg him to save your soul? You don't accept Jesus into your heart. You beg him to save your soul. I'm not saying that you won't be saved if you accept Jesus into your heart. I just hope you understand you need to be humble about it. And that you actually need him. <laughs> because there's a hell. And you don't want to go there. 
Finally, the third lesson that I have for us today is um, that those unwilling to give themselves wholly over to Jesus cannot expect to stand for godly morality when forced to make a choice. Let me say that again slowly. Those unwilling to give themselves wholly over to Jesus, a herod, cannot expect to stand for God, God's morality, God morally, when forced to make a choice. And that's what happened with Herod. He was forced to make a choice. And he chose, it's the easy path. And that's what your body and your mind will naturally incline towards. Even as a believer, you're still stuck in a physical body. Your body's going to go, go that way. Right? Your heart will say, go that way. Because your heart doesn't want to lose things and people and friends and jobs. All the things that could be at risk when we are forced into these situations. Amen? Pride and the fear of man are very real hindrances and tools of Satan. To get us to go against what is right and of the Lord. Of what is godly. Think it cannot happen to you? Ladies and gentlemen, I give you King Herod. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for this message. And um, Lord, it's not your typical Mother's Day message, but... Here you have it, Lord. Um, not at all dishonoring the mothers that are here today. You know my heart for them. You know, I know your heart for them, Lord. And so we honor them this day, Lord God. We ask you, Lord, that you would just teach us, Lord, by this message, Lord, that we may be closer to you, grown into more maturity in you, Lord God, and that we may, may be salt and light to a world out there that needs salvation and needs your grace so desperately. We love you, Lord.